that, yep. Uh, so you, all of you know that Taffy is one of our observer team uh, based up in Northland. So he's had the chance to see a whole range of facilitators around the place. Plus he's just started facilitating his own action group, which is really cool. Um, so Taffy, I'm gonna hand over to you and we'll stop at various points just to check in with everyone on the call and um, take it from there. So I'll hand over to you, thanks Taffy. Are you there, Taffy? I am here. Excellent. So thank you, Denise. Um, my name is Taffy. Uh, most, some of you I've met, like Tony, um, some I haven't, but just a brief background. I've been on the Observer team and I have a couple of groups that I'm running. And my role on the Observer team has really been about uh, coming and seeing facilitators in action, giving them a pat on the back in areas that they're doing well, and uh, also helping them identify their next development steps um in terms of improving their facilitation skills uh, some of my previous uh, roles include um, farm consultancy which is what i'm doing currently with ag first based up in Whangarei. i've uh, been a rural banker and i've also been involved in uh, running extension groups at dairy nz and also managing extension teams i've been so interested in the area of extension that i um had the opportunity to do a Nuffield uh, project where I focused on um, good to great extension, um, how to increase practice change at pace and scale. So that's a brief about my background. And like most of you, I love leading a group as a facilitator, but I do quite feel energy drained at the end of, uh, of running a group, especially when it's a large group, when you've got a seminar of 100 plus people. And it's true that the facilitate the group feeds off your energy as a facilitator. And I'd say probably about 50% of the success of any event or group that a facilitator runs is really comes down to uh, the quality of facilitation. So one person can make a difference in the area of facilitation. And today I'm hoping that we can share some tips on how you can better enjoy the moment or moments of facilitation without feeling too drained at the end of it, like I sometimes do. So I've got one main outcome is for us to, you know, keep building on our facilitation toolbox. So that, that's the main outcome I'd like all of us to achieve or get to. And in achieving that, I've got two objectives. One is to share some tips of things I've seen um, that we could pick up and use. And the second objective is um, just share some tips around how do we get the best out of our subject matter experts at our events. So those are two objectives. Uh, before I get into the content, I'd like just to paint a scenario um, around this area of facilitation and change. So change is something that is hard for all of us. It's not easy. And uh, many times we have different excuses for not making change on an area that may be of interest um, or an area that somebody else thinks is of interest or importance to us. And farmers make these same comments, you know, I'm too busy, I've tried it and it didn't work for my farm or my farm system. I don't actually know how to go about this process or I'm just not motivated enough. And today, hopefully we can identify some ideas on how do we make it easier for our farmers to change and how do we overcome some of these barriers to change. So that, that's the uh, picture I want to paint that change is uncomfortable, it's not easy, but how do you put some approaches in place that can actually make us achieve that easier? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent. So I have seven uh, points that I would like to share with you and I'll just quickly run through those and then I'll come and um, try and put a little bit of detail around each of them. So my first uh, tip is 
debriefing the last activity to help keep the group accountable. So that's approach or top tip number one. Um, focusing on the objective of the day, number two. Um, some of the conversations around the pre-work is our third point. And some tips around when you're on the farm tour and a post-work discussion and then talk about a close, closing the particular event or activity that you're running. And the last point is going to be on uh, subject matter expert due diligence and seeking clarity uh, with the subject matter expert. So I'll go with my first point, which is about debriefing the last activity. Quite a number of these points that I have outlined, I've also checked in with my co-observers and um, we were aligned in about four out of the seven. So it was quite consistent in terms of some of the good practices that we had seen. So I've picked some of their points and added them to what I had put together. So debriefing the last activity is probably one of the most important things that we've seen that actually drives a group efficiency and effectiveness because it really connects the last event and um, what people have actually done after that last event. And it helps start getting people on that change cycle where something might not be comfortable to them. Uh, they've had some training and the next bit is about what have you actually done about it? So comments I have here is, it's important to include time for a good debrief prior to starting your next event. So make sure it's on your agenda. Um, circulate that as part of the expectations of your agenda before the event and put some questions out there so that people have time to reflect on what they will talk about. So some of the things that you could prompt people on that have worked well for others is as a result of our last event or activity, what are the things that you have started doing, uh, stopped doing, implemented and share some results? So that, that kind of prompts people to think about what else, what am I going to be talking about as an update of the information that we shared at the last event. One other technique I found that works really has worked well for facilitators is if the event has been based or focused on a farm, is to actually print the recommendations that it came out from the last event um, so that you can prompt the host farmer in terms of what were the recommendations so that they can use that to give feedback to their peers on what they've decided they'll do. So that's the first um, approach there. Denise, probably we'll open up for questions for this one, because this is probably the most important one that we've all as observers have seen that effective groups do really well. Cool, thanks Taffy. Um, so I'm just gonna go around. Tony, any comments or questions? Yeah, I'm just thinking, one of my groups, we've got a bit of tension about making sure we're not a discussion group. And I'm sort of happy from what you've kind of said, I, that some of the bells that have rung for this group is a little bit around, um, we're, we're going to actually decrease our, expo, our time on farm visits um, and actually uh, get back and actually talk about probably the off, sort of not so much the off farm, but uh, the, the non-cows and grass kind of sheep and grass stuff. Um, but, but I think you still applicable to that. But um, yeah, since we've got a bit of tension going, one of those groups is, um, so it's, it's a really good opportunity. Like you said, debriefing the last meeting, um, we've got some sort of uh, resetting goals and staying on track kind of stuff in one of them. Definitely. Cool. Genevieve. Wondering how long would you typically spend at the start of each meeting debriefing? Interesting question. What do you think? I think I don't spend long enough. Um, I it sort of depends on the situation, I suppose. Like I've got quite a new group and we're sort of um, pulling them together. And so I probably have been spending like 15 minutes, but 
I, I think as we gel more, it's been longer, like around more like half an hour, because they'll hopefully have more robust discussions and more to discuss. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, uh, my thoughts are it's probably between 15 and 30 minutes. I think okay. this is quite a core part of the helping support people through practice change. Um, yeah. Because by having this conversation, you'll be able to, you know, put your finger on the pulse and say, uh, how are people going? Is there something that we probably need to revisit as a group because there's a bit of a gap in whether it's knowledge or skills? Or this is an area that people have really picked up and, um, and, and, and implemented quite easily themselves without needing any more further support. And really the key bit, when, when we talk about practice change um, and having this conversation, I find you know, when people have a sense that they're going to be accountable for, mm. to communicate back to their peers, they're more likely, that, so that once they know that this is the culture of the group, we're going to start off by talking about what have we thought about the interesting conversations or the um, messages that we've heard. I think people internalize that and they become more prepared to share what they've actually done or thought about doing about what they're learning in that group. Cool. Thank Doug, <laughs> Doug, any questions or comments? No, no real comments. I think, you know, the D or no real questions, the debriefing idea is really good. I tend to spend about 30 minutes and it sort of gets the group um, back into, I don't know, into that sort of group situation. Cause often with, some from over the in the Manawatu and the rest in the Wairarapa, they don't sort of communicate all the time. Um, and also it does identify where those gaps are, where you probably need a bit of further learning or further development for them. So it gives me a chance to sort of think, oh yeah, they didn't really understand that. But it's also good to find out the things that they have been putting in practice and how it's been going on their farms and that. So yeah. Well, oh. good. Good. Briar. I was hoping I'd get away with that, actually, Denise. Um, I think this, this is something I haven't been doing very well, but I think it's probably would be really useful in my group because they, I don't think they've actually reflected and celebrated their success that they've had so far, which I think is something that we need to do. Cool. Any comments? Do you want to keep, want me to take, keep going? Yes, please. Yeah, yes. unless there's any comment from what you've just heard. Yes. So the second uh, tip is around the objective for the day. Um, I've seen really good um, briefings go out on the agenda in terms of what the objective is coming up and the event coming up. Um, I've seen the people taking the next step of actually displaying it um, on the day. So it's there on the wall and everybody um, has got a chance to reflect on it. And on the odd, odd occasion, I've seen people actually refer to it when they feel, I think where we are drifting is probably not aligned with our objectives that we've set for the day. It gives facilitators a really good negotiation platform around achieving the outcomes that they had set as a group. So just keeping the objective alive um, as part of your day is my second top tip. Number three, I'll go to number three and then we can open up for a bit of conversation. Um, around the pre-work, what is the pre-work that is required? Um, we all know pre-work and post-work is really the lifeblood of trying to achieve change in these groups. So around the pre-work, uh, what I've seen that has worked well is asking the group, what sort of preparation do they think they need to be doing before the next event? So it gets, it's their words, and as a facilitator, it makes your job easier to hold them accountable to the pre-work that they, they themselves have picked out as important that they need to be prepared for, whether it's questions or things that they need to go and do and come and feedback to the group. 
and then making sure that you f we follow up on 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 the preparation that they've agreed to in terms of when we send out the agenda before the next meeting so th those two there in terms of the day's objective um, and some pre-work discussion and how do you actually get ideas or questions to put in the pre-work briefing do we want to stop there denise and have a bit of a yarn yeah just if anyone's got any questions please jump in or comments it's a great idea to get them to set their pre-work or have a discussion about the pre-work um, when they set the topic for the next meeting mm. wonderful i'll go to my next point oh, my, my okay hey, sorry Mary genevieve has got something i think have you jen <laughs> yeah i was just gonna say i've been getting my groups to say what the key um what they're going to do between now and the next meeting and i write it up and then take photos of it and keep bombarding them with them. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Briar? Go Tappy. <laughs> okay. Um, the on-farm tool. So um, some of the good practices that we've seen, uh, there's a lot of conversations that happen on the farm tour. You know, you hop into cars, you stop at the sheep, hop into cars and you go and look at some regrassing that has been done, hop into cars and you look at some subdivision. So there's a lot of uh, conversation that happens in that stop start session. What we've seen in terms of great practice is the facilitator just before you close that conversation and go to the hop into cars to go to the next stop is actually to summarize what the key points are at that session you know there's a lot of conversation a lot of different perspectives and i think rounding up that conversation just synthesizes everything and leaves it at a really clear crisp point what was the key message from that particular stop and some of those points ideally um you know one other one other observer said you know those are the comments that you pretty much want to be including in your group summary that gets emailed to the group members at the end because that summarizes the key points from the day and it gives them a reference point when they want to discuss what happened at the group with somebody else who probably did not come to that event so that's the on-farm tour really important around the summary how much do you think it's up to the facilitator to write the notes um, not a lot, to be honest. I, I think the key points ideally should be generated from the group. Mm. Um, and then our, our, our job is to probably potentially to document it. But in terms of, so yeah, I'll answer your question two ways. In terms of generating <laughs> those points, I think the, the points should come from the conversation that happens. But I think in terms of writing them down and capturing them, 50% of that is the facilitator. And 50%, I'll leave the other 50% to be the subject matter expert when they come um, by creating an expectation that they give you a bit of a summary or a one page or six bullet points, however you decide to request for some summary points from them. I think that constitutes the other 50%. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Post-work discussion. So really key pre-post-work lifeblood of getting change in groups. Um, in the post-work conversation, it's, it's, it's a really good um, thing to ask the farmers, what post-work do they think they need to be focusing on when they go back to their farms? And it could be when you ask people, what is the one take-home message and what are they gonna do? When they get back that could be when we capture it but the conversation i think should move a step further and i've seen this done really well at um, a couple of groups where the facilitator pairs up people that are close to each other so that they can work together uh, this was mainly on condition scoring use and people identified this is something that they were not doing very well but really made a difference and they committed to 
helping each other. So they'll go and work together to condition scoring their use and come up with a plan. And then at the next group, they came back and reported back on how that process had gone and what were some of the actions that they were going to take. So the group, the power, the knowledge is in the room, but it's about how we harness it as facilitators. And I've seen people do really well around that post work. Denise, we might have a bit of a yarn here about the on-farm tour, what people are doing around summarizing conversations and how they're going about their post work. Excellent. Yep. So I'm going to start with you, Doug. Can I? Oh, I better unmute then, eh? Yep. <laughs> yep. So we haven't actually done an on-farm visit yet. Um, we're planning to go down to Marlborough next month and spend a couple of days down there. So there'll be a lot of pre, sort of pre-visit work, and there'll be post workshop stuff coming out of that as well. So the pre stuff will be getting them focused on what they want to come away with, which um, is interesting because it's taking a bit of drawing out of them of, of what they do want to get. <clears throat> so it's a bit of guidance there. Um, and what was the other one? Was I'm summarizing. Oh yeah, they're both they're both to do with the farm visits, eh? So yeah, so I can't really add a lot there at the moment. Fair enough. Briar, what about you? Um, so I've got a good opportunity to use this um, post work discussion coming up. Um, I've had we did our first round of uh, water quality testing, and then two of them had to go off and retest a month later because um, they're they've been rostered on so to speak for the water testing for their group so they can um do a great report back at the next meeting as part of that which will be cool cool yeah i'm keen to try um peer people i've got a meeting on farm next wednesday so i'm quite keen to we've been workshop bound <laughs> till now so i think the mum farm will be good um and keen to get out of them what the key opportunities are um things that they want to focus on after our session and then look to see where we might be able to pair people up um to sort of help coach each other or provide some support over the phone or in person i think it's quite a cool idea make them accountable to supporting each other <laughs> a sort of a group that's I think still leaning on me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Takes a bit of work, but yeah, it sounds like you're going to get there. <laughs> Give them a kick in the bum, we'll be right. <laughs> Fair enough. Tony, what about you? Um, yeah, I'm just at the next two topics. So I've got around one strategic planning and one group succession planning. Um, and I think probably pairing them up might be useful for both of them. Oh, and it sounds like Taffy will have to get a bit of a um, debrief maybe at the start of the next Zoom call to see who's tried it and, um, yeah, get some feedback on that. That's right. And I think there is, you know, a certain level of uh, peer pressure and expectation that I'm actually going to do something because I'm going to get a call from my colleague um, or they're going to come over and we're going to work through with it's body condition scoring or reviewing each other's strategic plans and just giving each other feedback because that's probably what we don't do very well in discussion groups you know we have great session and we go away and into our own worlds and we just move on um, but that whole accountability I think is really key when we talk about practice change definitely excellent um, my sixth point so the second to last is the close. Um, and this is the close of the event itself. Um, talked about this point earlier on in terms of asking people to reflect on the day and to share what is one thing that, what, what is their key message from the day? And what is one thing that they're keen to go and try? And if you can capture that, that's going to be golden for you because when you do your, um, your debrief, you can use that as a reference point 
at the last session, this was one of the things you were going to try. How did it go when you went back to the farm? Who did you talk to? What are your next steps? And we talked about summarizing after each stop, um, really key in terms of just making sure that people leave with a nice, clear, crisp um, understanding of what the key points at the session were. Because whether we like it or not, there's a lot of different ideas that get thrown around. Some of the ideas are from you know, good practices. Some of them are like um, tales of, okay, right, if you did this, this works, when in actual, in practice, it's probably not really a science-based position. So, and a call to action at the end. There's some key points that come up from conversation from your subject matter expert or from the day where you feel these key points are things that the group should be trying. Um, that could be some of the things that you put in your in your clothes. Um, I'll go to my last number seven point, and then we can have a discussion. Um, the subject matter expert managing the due diligence and clarity. So due diligence really is about asking other facilitators who have used the facilitator. Uh, what are the strengths of the facilitator? What are the areas that you know they didn't? do as well or cover as well and what were the reasons why part of those reasons could be they didn't have enough time um, or they were probably not the right person to cover this particular topic so I think in that homework of a subject matter expert is quite important Denise do we have the directories publicly available now that facilitators can go and see which groups have used which expert um, we don't have which groups have used which expert. We do have the RP directory. Um, we try to cover it at Action Hubs a little bit. Uh, it depends on the Action Hub. Um, so we've got a, a bit of information from the Action Hubs we've run so far, which I'm happy to circulate because there were some good recommendations. Um, yeah, is that of interest? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, that could help short circuit the whole you know, finding out what, what are the points that they covered really well and what are the areas that, you know, are not really their strong points. Yeah. So in terms of clarity of uh, subject matter experts, um, that's probably the real crux that drives the content of what your subject matter expert will cover. Um, and some of the things that I have here that I've seen people do well is giving them a good brief on how much time they have um, even down to the detail of, you know, it'll be probably good for the audience if we don't have more than 25 slides because you can have people getting a bit seasick from seeing slides being uh, moved. Um, and asking for that one pager. So the question earlier on how much of a responsibility is it on facilitators around the summary? I'd ask for that one pager or some key points, some of their key points. Can you email me your key points? Because sometimes it's hard to actually capture it as well um, on the particular day. But if they provided it, then you know that it's pretty much coming from the horse's mouth. Sharing your group objective and specific objective for the day or the event is quite useful for subject matter experts. I was speaking to a couple of them and uh, they mentioned that, you know, it would be good if I knew what this group was trying to achieve or what they wanted me, what they wanted to achieve on this day. So they told me what they wanted me to cover, but I had no context of linking that with the bigger picture of what the group wants to achieve. So that came directly from two different subject matter experts at events that I've been. And I think as facilitators, we can pretty much, you know, provide that information, which just helps them have a holistic picture. A um, couple other points came from some of my other observer colleagues is it's really useful when a facilitator and a subject matter expert are tag teaming for a bit of group voice variety, vocal variety, I think that's what they were implying here. Um, 
and you know to add another step there might be you know they cover an area and then you come in and ask people so what are the key messages that we've heard from this session um and farmers are you know communicating back what they've heard what are the key points what are the key takeouts they see in that and the other point coming from my co-observers is as a facilitator um, it's good not to shy away from asking the hard or the obvious questions. So playing the devil's advocates, those were the actual words. That's me, Denise. Um, open up for questions or conversation around the subject matter expert due diligence and giving them good clarity. Cool. Um, thanks, Tappy. Um, Tony, any questions or comments? No, I think that's uh, that's sort of full brief, probably. I've got a bit of room to improve there. I've given them a verbal, but I'm probably better off to give them something in writing that they can mull over a little bit and um, take it all in. Yeah, I guess it helps with people, um, yeah, just different um, personalities and ways we engage with information. So that definitely is helpful. Yeah, and different capability in the two groups. I've got uh, one's uh, a real cracker jack group, and the other one's uh, just good. Uh, good hungry farmers. Yep. Cool. Doug, anything you want to comment or add or um, ask a question about? Um, no, not really. I've just picked, you know, I've been picking up some really good ideas here today, which is, you know, good for the new guy on the block. <laughs> He's only done two sessions so far. Um, like at my last one, I had Peter Kemp, and yeah, he's he's a really good subject matter expert talking to farmers and farm land, which was brilliant. Um, but I can see how I could have actually improved that session as well. So, um, sorry, Doug, I missed, I missed what, you, what you talk on. I missed that. It just cracked up with it. I had Peter Kemp talking on um, sort of using legumes better in the hill country. Um, and yeah, he's you know, he a lot of people think he's all plantain, but no, he knows a lot about the clovers and lucerns as well. So, um, but he's he speaks in a really relaxed but really informative you know style. So, um, but I'm lucky I didn't have to pay the going rate for him because he's one of my supervisors from a PhD, so <laughs> I'm not sure what he costs. Special deal, Doug. Yeah, yeah, I just had to pay for the car for the day, so yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah. I know, I think Paul Kingdom's pretty good as well, so. Oh, okay. Okay. Excellent, Genevieve. I had time talking to my export experts beforehand, developing, like fleshing it out and developing the agenda so that I understand what they think the key messages are that need to be going through and how that lines up with what the farmers are wanting to learn. Um, and then kind of develop quite a detailed agenda around that. So my experts receive um, yeah, a run sheet, essentially. Just We worked the same run sheet. Um, I suppose the real benefit for me, like I've been facilitating groups for two and a half years now, um, is that I've repeated quite a few workshops and it's given me the opportunity to start co-facilitating with some of the experts I've used lots and to, I've learned so much um, so that now I'm able to add more value as a facilitator because I understand the topic and can kind of tie it together um, and I suppose step into that expert role in a sense just to summarise and to um, pull it together a wee bit, yeah. Um, so I, yeah, doing the detailed bit has been really helpful for me to learn and I like to know what's happening <laughs> and it's always nice when you're on the same page so yeah it's cool and it's been cool especially when the experts like oh like Genevieve you can take this section and so they end up doing but like co-delivering with them which has been awesome yeah cool Briar any comments questions no fair enough <laughs> Any um, comments, questions back, Taffy? Um, oh, I think, um, can, can I just summarise and then I can talk about some other point, one other point that I would like to make? Yeah. Yeah. 
So ultimately, as a facilitator, uh, my view, personal view, is more than 50% of the success of our groups really ranges, hinges around how we plan the content of the day and how flexible we are to adapt to the environment around us, whether it's the weather or other things, burning platforms around uh, the farmers we're interacting with, whether it's some of the environmental issues that are there now, uh, whether we like it or not, those are you know, going to influence the, what we cover. But I think there's things that we can do that can make a difference. And some of the bits that I've shared today, I think uh, whether it's these action groups or any particular group, you know, are things that I think will make a difference in terms of actually driving to change. Lift the conversation from just, I come to an event, I listen, I'm excited about stuff, I go to my farm and I get busy or distracted, don't know where to start and end up not actually doing anything. And this is the golden area with action groups where we can actually follow through and help support people to move from step A to step B in terms of practice chain. So the key, the key areas that I, I have covered and we have discussed about is really about making sure that we allow enough time to debrief the last activity. Part of that is prepping the group what the debrief is going to look like. What are you gonna stop doing, start doing? Um, continue doing in your farm business a result of the last activity. Having clarity on the objective for the day and keeping it visual for people to constantly reflect on it or for a facilitator to use to, as a bit of a drafting gate on any other odd ideas that come up during the course of the day. Um, that pre-work conversation discussion, having the, asking the group what sort of pre-work do they think they need to be doing um, to get themselves ready for that particular event. So same conversation around the post-work. What, what does the post-work look like after this session? So you're getting the group to commit to things that they would like to do, making your job as a facilitator easy in terms of holding them accountable. On the on-farm tour, summarizing each stop to make sure that the key messages are identified. And in the close, asking group members or participants to reflect back and share what was their one key message from the day and what are they gonna go away and try when they get on farm. And then the last area we covered is the subject matter expert. So doing some due diligence around a subject matter expert is really important because it helps you get the best out of that particular person. We, we are not all experts in everything, but if we know what areas we're strong in and we can play to those strengths, I think um, our groups are gonna get the maximum benefit in terms of content. Sharing some of the group objectives and specific days objective with the subject matter experts just helps them so that they can connect their message to the bigger picture for the group. So that, that's, that's really the core of what I had to share based on what I've seen um, at, at the different groups that I've been an observer. And now putting on the facilitator's shoes at the two groups that I run, um, it's really interesting reflecting on it and it's the whole change does take time. We just have to be patient and trust that when we've got a good process that if we keep trying to bring that process alive, we're gonna get there. Uh, Cause some of these things are hard to do because you're thinking, well, it didn't quite work. But once you have the group into a bit of a culture that this is gonna come up at our group, I'm gonna have to feed back report back on how I've gone in trying these things. I think it'll become, the group will become more comfortable with it because it's something that they hear more and more times being mentioned. And I encourage you guys to go and try some of these things and feedback on this platform or to each other or 
flick me a comment on how it's gone when you've tried it. I'll leave it there, Denise. Brilliant. Thank you, Taffy. Any last questions or comments for Taffy? That was really helpful. Thank you so much, Taffy. I think it'd be quite cool as facilitators if we did some debriefs on this call to see what people have done differently. Yeah, it's a good point. Yep, good stuff. Yep, loving it. Thank you. Doug Breyer, any yep. comments or thoughts? No, no, thanks very much for all that, um, what you've shared with us today. And I, yeah, I agree that it would be good to do a debrief because I'm certainly going to go away and try some of it. And um, yeah, it sort of reaffirmed some of the stuff that I've already know, but it's also sort of introduced slightly different texts on some of it. So no, I really appreciate it. Oh. Right, any last comment? Uh, that was really good, thanks, Taffy. Um, that I'm actually just about to set an agenda and things for my next group meeting, so um, that's going to be really helpful for working out exactly how we're going to to deliver that content. And there's definitely some things I can take on board. Thank you. Thank you, Taffy. Any last comment from you? Um, but. One of the things that I've given people feedback on is to map their energy levels as the group progresses. So basically an X and a Y axis and say, okay, right, um, where was the high point? So what were the high points in, in, in the day? And then what, which ones were the low ones? Really interesting. I was introduced to this concept by, you know, somebody who was coaching me in extension. And they said, if you know your high points, you know those are the areas that, you know, you don't, you just need to continue going. And, but if you also understand what are the points when you dip, when your energy level dips, is it when you ask people to be accountable for their actions? Cause some people struggle with that. Mm -hmm. um, or it might be on the farm tour, you know, that might be your low energy point and having a bit of a plan um, or asking for support from your group or from other people that are there to help you through those dips. And, Lab shared with us some energizers. Could be an energizer where you, just before you do that session, you might just give people an activity so that you just regroup yourself and, um, and then kick off into that session such that you lift your energy levels. Because your energy as a facilitator really resonates or feeds into. So that, that's some, one thing that I'd encourage you guys to think about. Mapping your energy level when you run events and understanding your dips and then working out how do you actually turn that dip into a bit of a crest. That's a really cool point to end on, I think, Taffy, because, yeah, that's a good challenge for us all when we're facilitating. Um, very quick chance for any last questions before I close off. No? Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Taffy. That was brilliant. It's always good to hear uh, and learn from others' experience and get some tips. So, hey, thanks for joining us. This recording will be available in the next week or so. I'll flick around a link. It'll be with the other recordings. I'll also circulate a few things like Taffy's notes. He's going to get them to me. Um, the link to his Nuffield report if you're interested. Uh, and I also had down some of the experts that are being used that we've had feedback from Action Hub. So, Anything else you wanted me to circulate? Nope. Nope, good. Cool, well.